Well, good morning, everybody. We did it. We made it. We have started. We are here, as Pastor Fernando said, better late than never. Um, it's just been one of those days, I think, for most of us this morning, but we have powered through. We are here, and we are ready to go. If you would stand with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your grace, your mercy, that you give us new every morning. I know I say it every week, but the gratefulness of it is still there every week because you don't have to, but you choose to. And we thank you for it. We thank you for your love. And we just ask that you would be with us today. Bless each person. Bless the fathers, the ones who are biological fathers, the ones who are mentors, who are bonus fathers, all of those men who are playing a fatherly role in the lives of children. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would help them to feel appreciated. And those whose lives they are affecting, help them to show appreciation for those father figures because there will still be those who don't get that experience. And we especially ask a blessing for those Christian godly fathers who are showing the way being examples so that these young people that they are in charge of, that they are leading, that they are mentoring, would know you and be able to follow you as disciples. In Jesus' name, we ask you to be the service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Holy, holy is our God Almighty. 
praises our Lord, only you, heaven's eclipse, it is you, it is you, it is you, it is you, it is you. It is you. Jesus conquered the grave. 
church that starts half hour late. <laughs> so thank you for your patience with us. Um, I don't have any other announcements other than our usual Wednesday night Bible prayer and Bible study starting on uh, 7 o'clock on this and every Wednesday. Um, God bless you all. You are in the hands of Pastor Fernando. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church family, and happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there uh, and you mothers who act as fathers. I'm going to say happy Father's Day to you, too. That includes you, Mom. Happy Father's Day, Mommy. So, uh, yeah, we do. Uh, there are quite a few single mothers out there who act as fathers. But today we are talking about Father's Day. We are actually talking about and uh, look, it's uh, it's a it's a great it's a great privilege to be a father. And in honor of Father's Day, I have a couple of dad jokes for you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, these are guaranteed to make you groan. So just bear with me here. <laughs> After an unsuccessful harvest, why did the farmer decide to try a career in music? Why? Why? Because he had a ton of sick beats. <laughs> I mean, these are so bad, they're actually funny. Uh, okay, here's another one. I always seem to get sick on weekdays. I must have a weekend immune system. <laughs> so, who were the greenest presidents in U.S. history? The Bushes. <laughs> okay, now this one's my absolute favorite, okay? My friend was showing me his tool shed, and he pointed to a ladder. He said, that's my step ladder. I never knew my real ladder. <laughs> <laughs> that one's just so terrible, you have to laugh at it. I'm serious. That's very good. <laughs> so praise God. You know, I do wear a lot of hats in my life. You know, uh, I, I have a lot of titles. I am I am pastor. I am a son, I am a husband, uh, but I think, and, and 
Believe it or not, I actually have the title in my family of fashion consultant. Now, look, it's not that funny, okay? <laughs> actually, it is kind of funny. Uh, because I know nothing about fashion, quite frankly. Uh, but, you know, I got into the habit of going shopping with my wife, and one day, uh, very early in our marriage, uh, we were shopping one day, and I saw something that I thought would look good on her. So I took it off the rack, and I handed it to her. I said, here, try this on. And that kind of became a habit. And so every time we would go shopping, you know, while my wife is doing whatever it is you women do in the store, uh, I've got my eyes open, and I'm looking at different things, and I'm like, well, you know, I think she'd look good in that, or I think she'd look good in that. And I've gotten very good at it. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I was in a, a, a clothing store with my wife, and I was picking out an outfit for her, specifically. I mean, we actually specifically went so I could pick out an outfit for her. And the sales lady actually looked at me and says, oh my goodness, do you do this for a living? And I had to laugh. I'm like, lady, I'm standing here in jeans and an old sweatshirt. And you think I do this for a living? But it's funny because after watching this throughout her life, my youngest daughter uh, decided that when she needed adulting clothes, that's what she called it, she said, and she came to me, she said, daddy, I need adulting clothes, but you need to take me shopping. So I don't know how that happened, but I, I have the title of fashion consultant in my family. But of all the titles that I have, of all the uh, hats that I wear, my favorite title is that. And look, in a, in a world that has minimized you fathers, that has told you that you don't matter, I, need, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand something very important, fathers. You matter. Amen. You really do matter. And as a matter of fact, study after study after study tells us that fathers matter. Growing up without a father can actually alter the structure of your brain. And it produces children who are more aggressive and angry. You know, that's very interesting in a society that talks about uh, uh, male aggressiveness and talking about how aggressive we are as males, it, it's funny that growing up without a father actually makes people more aggressive. And, you know, uh, children who are brought up without a father actually have a higher risk of developing deviant behavior, like drug abuse. So, fathers, I want you to understand this. The world continues to lie to us, and the world will continue to lie to you. But I am here to tell you the truth you actually matter. And as a matter of fact, this, I'm sorry, my computer is acting up on me now. And of course it is. <laughs> it's just one of those days, right? You know? All right, uh, here we go. I got it back. Uh, so, it is very, and it's, very, it's so important to be a father because Jesus Christ, here's the other reason that it's so important to, to be a father is since Jesus Christ introduced God to us as our Heavenly Father, the kind of father you are will affect how your children think about God. And if you are a harsh father, a, a, a full disciplinarian, then you know a lot of times your kids are going to think that about God. They're going to think that God is harsh and always looking to discipline them. If you are absent which is the worst thing in the world. If you are absent, ch your children are likely to think that God doesn't care about them either. So when your children hear that God is their Heavenly Father, what, you, what is it that they think of? They're going to think in the same way that you brought them up, in the, in the way that you are. They're basically going to be thinking about you. And if you have been a good father, look, we all make mistakes. I've made my share as a father. But if you've been a good father, then they are more likely to think of God as a good father. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a good father? Well, it's very interesting because uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, Paul writes, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. I find this interesting because we have a bit of a uh, 
stereotype in our brain of what a first century father was, right? Uh, in the ancient world, uh, we, we probably think that fathers back then were, were pretty much detached from the family, right? They, they went out, they made a living, they did whatever they had to do to support the family. But basically, mom was the one who was taking care of the day-to-day -day, uh, things that had to do with the children. But here, Paul is telling the, 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 the Thessalonian church, we treated you the way a father treats his children. So he's telling you that a father treats his children by encouraging, comforting, and urging them to live lives worthy of God. I find this interesting because we carry, we carry that stereotype for so many years in our own society. And among, among Christian, uh, Christian nations sometimes, that, that stereotype still exists. The father is the breadwinner, the one who is the disciplinarian, but mom is the one who encourages and comforts and all of that. But just like we talked about on Mother's Day, right? We talked about the Proverbs 31 woman, and when you look at Proverbs 31, we see a mother who is on equal footing with her husband, uh, on an equal partner in the family. Well, in the same way, the fathers are too. You are just as much of an encourager and a comforter as your wives or the mother of your children. You know, a, a study published by the Journal of Family Psychology found that the less support a child receives, the more problems they will experience. They need encouragement. Matter of fact, one of my favorite characters in the New Testament is Barnabas. And Barnabas, you know what Barnabas was known for? He was known for being encouraging. That was it. That was what he was known for. His entire ministry was based on the fact that he was an encourager. And that's what his name, that, and actually his name was not Barnabas. They called him Barnabas because that means son of encouragement. That's how much being an encourager was a part of his personality. You know, it was, it was Barnabas who brought Paul to the disciples. Paul, who uh, persecuted the church. I mean, he was arresting uh, people who called on the name of Jesus. He was arresting them and, and putting them in prison and taking, binding, you know, binding them and, and taking them before the, the, uh, the religious officials to be prosecuted. And when Paul came to Jesus, the disciples didn't want anything to do with him. They're like, no, no, he's just trying to get in here so he can, so he can arrest us. It was Barnabas who walked in and, and took Paul and brought him to the disciples and said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is what happened. And he was an encourager for, for the apostle Paul. And fathers, in that same way, you are an encourager for your family. You know, when your kids are going through a, a rough time, when, when things happen that, that they don't understand, it, you, know, you can step in and encourage them. When they're, you know, now look, we, we think of encouragement, you know, usually in, in terms of performance, right? Dads, let's be honest. We, we think of encouragement like when, you know, when they bring home a C and we're encouraging them to do a little bit better, right? That's not the only, that, that's not the only kind of encouragement we can do. You know, we have it within us to encourage our children in all situations. As a matter of fact, when they're, when they're overworked, when they're pushing themselves too hard, sometimes it's okay to encourage them to take it easy, to take a break, to relax. I know it's a foreign concept. <laughs> and I, you know, we, 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 we tend to, uh, we, like I've always said, we tend to let the culture influence us, right? And the culture is always about go, 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 never stop, never rest. You never have time for anything. Because you've always got to be on the move. My question is, what are you, what are you running? What are you running from? You're always on the move. It's like a hamster on a wheel, right? That's 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 the way I look at society. I mean, they're always. I always hear this. It doesn't matter what program I'm watching. I, I usually watch like the Food Network or HGTV, and especially on the Food Network, they're always talking about making meals in a hurry. Because hey, we're always so busy. We're always so busy. Busy doing what? What are you so busy doing? You know, we're so busy, we don't have time for our kids. We, we pawn off our children on other people. We put them in front of the TV, or, or even worse, we, we, we give them phones that they can sit on for hours and hours and hours because we just don't have time for them. No, no, that's not, that's not what God gave us our children for. And let's, let's always remember that children are a gift from God. Your children, first and foremost, belong to God. 
And he has put them on loan to you. And he wants you to represent him to them. And God is always an encourager. And, that, and yes, God does encourage you to rest every once in a while. You know, God created the universe in, in six days and he rested on the seventh, right? Did God need rest? No, of course not. He's not a human being. He didn't need to rest. But he did that so that he would provide us an example. He said, look, you're flesh and blood. You will need to rest. So fathers, it's okay to encourage your children to rest every once in a while. They don't always have to be pushing and striving all the time. Colossians 3.21 tells us, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Pretty simple verse, right? I've always said the Bible is quite simple to understand. Let's not push our kids too far. Let us, yes, we do need to encourage our children. Our children sometimes don't want to do what they're supposed to do, right? I'm, I was a child once, decades ago. Back when we had pet dinosaurs, right? <laughs> you know, I was a child once, and I didn't want to do my homework. And my mother, you know, my father wasn't around, unfortunately. My mother had to encourage me to do my homework. Because, you know, getting an education is important. And there are times where, you know, we give our kids chores. Why do we give our kids chores? Because we want them to learn responsibility. We want them to learn how to do things for themselves. Well, I mean, what child wants to do a chore? So, I mean, there are a, a lot of ways to encourage children. Sometimes we encourage them with reward. It's like, here, you, you know, you, here are your list of chores. If you do them, you get this much in allowance. Sometimes we threaten them, say, do this or die. You know? <laughs> That's dad, right? <laughs> mom is the one that's like, the mom is the one that tries to explain things to you. I always loved that as a kid. Because I'm sitting there thinking, wow, does she really think this is going to work? <laughs> mom, but mom is great. Mom is the one that, that sits you down and tries to explain everything to you. But dad is the one, you know, dad don't have time. Dad is like, look, just do it. <laughs> you know, I brought you in this world, and I can take it out, right? <laughs> You know what, I can't encourage that kind of behavior, right? I, as a pastor, I cannot encourage that. But let's be honest, it, you know, sometimes it works, right? But there are different ways to encourage our kids. Sometimes our kids just need you to put your arm around them and listen. And, and, and that's, that, I think that's the toughest thing about, uh, that's the toughest part of encouragement for guys especially. Guys, we are fixers, right? We like to fix things. Now, you know, somebody comes to us with a problem. Okay, here's the problem. How do we fix it? Well, sometimes your, your children don't need you to fix it. They just want you to listen. And that was the hardest thing I had to learn as, as a father and as a husband is to just listen. You know, my hand's shaking. It's like I want to do something. But, you know, just, no, no, I got to sit here and listen. Listening does matter. Listening can be. You know, when, when people feel that they are being heard, it is encouraging. You know, and that's especially true with our daughters. And maybe I shouldn't stereotype it like that. You know, guys need to be listened to as well. I, I can remember my biggest frustration as a, as a young person was when I felt like, like my mother wasn't listening to what I was saying. So, you know what, when your children want to talk, we, we've got to understand that sometimes the most encouraging thing you can do is to drop what you're doing and actually give them your attention. Mm -hmm. And that's hard, I know. I, I still struggle with it, quite frankly. You know, because we all have this experience, right? You're in a conversation, and before the person's finished talking, you want to respond, and you start talking over them. Happens all the time. I mean, I've had these, I, I've had conversations and I've, I've had to discipline myself on many occasions. Like, no, just shut up and let them finish. So I know it's not easy because our brains work very quickly. And you know what they're about to say. So it's like in your brain, they've already stopped talking and you're ready to respond. So you've got you've to quiet the mind sometimes and just say, no, no, just, just let them go. So fathers, let's, let's learn to be encouragers. I know it doesn't, you know, our, our society doesn't give us that title. 
Society doesn't say that you're the encourager. Society wants mom to be the encourager because they keep telling you that you don't really matter. But you do matter. If you encourage your children, they are more likely to see God as an encourager. They are more likely to go to God and, and feel that he is listening when you stop and you listen. And look, we love our children. We want to do these things. I know we do. It's just very hard sometimes to break those old habits. You know, because, he, you know, the best, the best thing you can do for me is give me a problem to solve. Now, you tell me something's going on and I can't do anything about it, I, it drives me crazy. But sometimes that's, that is the solution. Sometimes the solution is just to listen. It's just sit there, listen, let them know that you're, that you're and actually listen. That's what, and I probably should emphasize that. Don't, don't be thinking about the football game while you're listening. <laughs> you know, or the, or the, or the project you've got to finish. No, no, you've actually got to be present and listen. Sometimes that's the most encouraging thing that you can do for your children. Comforting. That's what, the, that's what the Paul says in, in Thessalonians as well. It's like they, fathers are comforting. Does that surprise you? Sometimes it surprises me to think of, of that. Now look, as, as a father of daughters, I, I understand comforting uh, my daughter because we, we, we have that stereotype in our mind that girls need comforting, but guys need a good swift kick in the pants, <laughs> Right? <laughs> You know, your son gets hurt. It's like, ah, come on! Shake it off! You're fine! You know, it's like, dude, I hurt myself. Where's the blood? Ah, it's not crying. <laughs> I, look, I grew up that way, man. I, I watched this many, many times. And look, my father was in prison. He was, he, was in, uh, he was in jail for the last 11 years of his life. But he did call. He did get one call every week. And uh, whenever I would talk to him, that was his message. He's like, hey, suck it up, dude. Life is hard. <laughs> now, <laughs> look, there is a place for that. But there's also a place to put your arm around your son and tell him, you know what, kid, it's okay to cry. I remember, <laughs> I remember the first time I told my son that I almost gave my wife a heart attack because it was the first time I'd ever said that. <laughs> she nearly fell over. Sometimes it's okay to do that. I mean, in general, moms are the ones who, who do the comforting. You know, we're more concerned with, you know, we're more concerned with preventing harm than comforting them after harm has come to them, right? Like, if somebody hurts my kid, I'm less concerned about comforting my child than finding the person that hurt them and hurting them back. I, I was not a Christian back then. <laughs> But it's okay, dads, it's, it's okay to, to, to be comforting, to, to put your arm around them, to let them cry on your shoulder. Now look, <laughs> let me tell you something. And, and dads, maybe you, can, maybe you can understand what I'm saying here. There is nothing that will spur me to action faster than hearing a woman I love crying. I mean, my... Uh, my wife, my daughter, whoever, somebody calls me, I pick up the phone, and they're crying. All of a sudden, I'm on my feet like, who do I got to kill? What's going on? What is happening in the world right now? I was like, I cannot stand to hear any woman I love cry, and I will do anything to get it to stop. Seriously. Because it just, something inside me just, you know, starts to get worked up when I hear that, that protector mentality kicks in. And sometimes we've got to push that down and say, no, no, maybe right now what they need is, is a shoulder to cry on. Maybe right now they need uh, somebody to put an arm around them and to comfort them. So it, it, it really does not come natural. It, especially to me. Now, for some guys it does. For some guys it, it does come naturally. I, I've seen fathers who were very comforting and, and very tender with their families, and I envy those guys. Because it doesn't come naturally to me. I, you know, I grew up without a father. and I, had to, I grew up having to be tough and unemotional in most circumstances. And so it was really hard for me to, you know, to get out of that mentality and realize that I'm no longer in that situation. My children were not raised in that situation. 
They don't need to be as hard as I was. Now look, life is tough. They do need to know the realities of life and how to deal with, with circumstances. But they don't have to be as hard as I was. And I needed to learn that as a father. I needed to learn how to comfort instead of, you know, again, trying to fix it. That we could be comforting fathers. It's, it, I don't know if anybody's ever actually told you that. Has anyone actually said that to you? That you can be comforting? Well, I'm telling you right now, you, as a father, you can comfort your children. It's okay to be comforting. And as a matter of fact, again, going back to being an example of God the Father, when you comfort your children, and I stand up here and I tell your children that God is a comforter, guess what? They're going to be thinking about you and say, yeah, I believe that. I believe God, as a father, can be a comforter, because my father is a comforter. And finally, I'm sorry, before I go to finally, Proverbs 14, 26. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. I guess that's language, uh, language that we can better understand, right? Is your children can find refuge with you. I like that. I like that image better. You know, that it, 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 it gives the, uh, the, the, uh, the illusion of, of protection. And dads, let's face it, that's, that's, that's how we see ourselves. That you can protect and comfort at the same time. And finally, again, this is, this is something that's a little more uh, to my liking. Urging them to live lives worthy of God. Now, we read these verses last week when we did uh, our baby dedication. But I think it is, it is something that we should all be thinking about as fathers. Deuteronomy 11, 18-20. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That is your responsibility. And look, it doesn't matter whether whether you are married to your children's mother or not, whether you live with your children or not. None of these things are negotiable. These are our responsibilities as fathers, as Christian fathers, people who represent God the Father. And this, I believe, is probably the most awesome responsibility that we have is urging them to live lives worthy of God. You've got to be involved with your children. How do you do that? Number one, you live it yourself. That is the biggest thing that I can tell you right now. You want your children to know God. You want your children to serve God. You have got to serve God. You have got to model what it is, that the behavior that you want them to be exhibiting. What's that old saying, right? Do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work. It simply does not work. Your children will do as you do. And look, let's be honest. They never do what you say anyway, right? So, <laughs> children never do what you tell them to. But they do watch you. And you may not, you may not believe it. You may not see it immediately. But they do watch you, and eventually they are going to be like you. And so let me ask you a question. When you look in the mirror, are, are you the kind of person that you want your children to be? That was, a, that was the, uh, one of the things that I, I thought about 20 years ago when I took a really good, hard look at myself. I said, you know what, if my kids turned out like me, would I be proud? And I had to say, no. If they, if they were like me, I would not have been proud of them back then, 20 years ago. Today, I can look at myself and say, if they did turn out like me, I'd be proud. Because I've become a better person. I've become a better Christian. I've become a better pastor, I hope. Just not yet. Just <laughs> 
But dads, you want to urge your children to live lives worthy of God. You want to see them get saved. Then you have got to be saved. They cannot see you running around with you know this woman and that woman. They cannot see you ignoring your responsibilities to them. They cannot see you living a life that is contrary to God's word. Do you want them to live according to the, to the word of God? Then you have got to live according to the word of God. And they will respect that. They may not listen. They may not always do what you tell them to do. But they will always respect who they see that you are. If your words line up with your conduct, then your children will respect you. And let's be honest, Father. What do we want more than respect in our families? I'll be, I'm just making a confession as a man and as a father. Yes, we want love, but more than anything else, we want respect. We want to be respected in our families. You want to be respected in your family, Father. Live a life that is worthy of respect. Urge your children to live lives worthy of God by living a life worthy of God yourself. Look, we make mistakes, right? Sometimes our children are the product of sin. Now, the children's the child is not sinful. The child is always a gift from God. But sometimes you go out and you make a mistake, and that and it produces a child. That doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to raise that child up. It doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to be an example to that child in in, in your life. And you can be a great example of what it means to truly repent. Because if they know that you made a mistake with their mother, but you've repented and since then you've lived a life worthy of God, they will respect that. They will see that. And in their own life, they will understand that it's okay to make a mistake. And as long as you turn around and you don't repeat the mistake. Now maybe you're like me, and you do repeat your mistakes. They'll see that it's okay to get a little bit better over time. That's the thing I want my kids to understand. I don't want them to think that they have to be perfect 24-7. What I want them to understand is that they should always be striving to be better. And in order to do that, I show them that I strive to be a little bit better. My children have watched me grow in the last 20 years. They've watched me mature as a Christian until I could become a pastor. And I hope that they have seen that they can do that themselves. I hope they understand that it's possible to be better, that you don't have to settle for where you are right now. That is how I urge my children to live godly lives. And whenever we have an opportunity, I can tell them, hey, I made that mistake too. I did the same thing that you just did. It doesn't have to ruin your life. It doesn't have to be the end of your dreams. You've got to pick yourself up and you've got to move. You've got to move forward. You've got to keep going. Look ahead. Don't ever look back. That is how I urge my children to live lives worthy of God because that is the life I live. I'm not a perfect person, but I'm always striving to be just a little bit better every day, and I hope my children see that. And I tell them that whenever I do talk to them, whenever they call me, and they do have a problem, they say, hey, I've, I've gone through that. I understand. But you know what I did? I put it behind me. And I trusted in God to make me better tomorrow. So fathers, I want to encourage you today. Tune out the world. Tune out what the world is telling you because the world is telling you that you don't matter, that, that you know children only need their mothers. No, they need you, fathers. Whether you are in their lives or whether you are living with them or not is irrelevant. You need to be in their lives, encouraging them, comforting them, and urging them to live lives worthy of God. Is there anything else in this world that is better than that. What it, what, whatever your profession, whatever you do for a living, will you get any greater satisfaction from that than seeing your children come to Jesus Christ? I don't think so. 
Knowing that my children are saved, knowing that they are serving the Lord, is the greatest accomplishment that any father could ever hope to achieve. And that is my encouragement to you, is to change your focus. If you've been focused on your career, if you've been focused on anything else, today is the day to focus on your kids, to be a father. It is never too late. If there is one thing I have learned in the 52 years of life that I have been on this earth, is that it is never too late to do the right. So if you've been, I don't care if you've been failing for 20 years, you can turn around today and be a better father starting right now. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads, church. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, dear God. We thank you because we can call you Father. We can call you Abba or Daddy. And we can come to you. We can come to you and be comforted. We can come to you and be encouraged. We can come to you and you will urge us on to live lives worthy of you, dear God. But as a father, and for all the fathers who are watching or who are here today and watching online, dear God, I just pray a blessing, dear God. I pray a blessing on them today. Whether they've been a good father or a bad father, today I pray that you will touch their hearts. That every one of us, Lord, will recommit ourselves to being the best possible representative of our Heavenly Father that we can be. Because what else are we here for? That is my prayer, Lord. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Amen.